So we're going to jump back in today in section 10.4. Specifically, we're looking at the measures of variation. And uh, we talked a little bit about uh, one type of variation, um, sort of this idea of range. Um, we looked at lower extremes and upper extremes and interquartile range and the box and whisker or box and whisker plot kind of thing that we looked at last time. Um, but we're going to shift gears, and the next couple of types of these are going to be very related to one another. Um, and they are about deviation specifically. So the first one is called mean absolute deviation. And it makes use of an absolute value to find the difference between each data point and the mean. It's found by taking all the absolute value differences and averaging them together. Okay, so I'm going to have you write down the, the three different things we're doing, and then we're going to actually do them. So this is mean absolute deviation. It has to do with absolute values, okay? The next one is called variance. So I've kind of got a list of steps for variance, um, and some of this list of steps is very similar for mean absolute deviation, as you'll see. But for variance, uh, we're going to find the mean if we don't already have it. We're going to subtract the mean from each number. So those steps one and steps two are part of mean absolute deviation as well. Uh, the third one is that we square the differences. Step four is we find the sum of those, so we add them all up. And then step five, just like in mean absolute deviation, is that we divide by our number of values. Um, standard deviation is just the square root of variance. So this isn't a letter that we usually use here, but I'm going to use it because I think it makes sense for us conceptually. If variance were called V, then all we would do to find the standard deviation, which I'll just abbreviate SD, is that we would take the square root of the variance. Okay, so it's just one extra step at the end of variance um, to find the standard deviation. That's not a very good looking V. All right, you guys ready to try one? Okay, we saw this data set last time. We worked with it and we found its mean. Um, so if you guys would flip back to the earliest problems we did yesterday and tell me what, what did we find for the mean for this? The mean has got this line on the top. What was it? 19.86. Fabulous. Okay, so we've got 19.86. And what we're going to do um, to find our mean absolute deviation is that we need to find the difference between that value and each of the individual values. Um, you don't have to do it in the table. I really like tables for these because I think they organize the data really well. So that's how I'm going to show it. If you did it differently, that would be okay. Um, but I'm going to take all of my x values that I had and put them in this column. And so I have, and I'm just going to go the order they're given to me, 18, 22, 22, 17, 30, 18, and 12. I'm going to make that a little bit smaller, too. Okay, so we have all these different values. And what we want to do is we want the absolute value between that x value and the mean. I want to know how far away it is from the mean. In other words, how far is 18 away from 19.86? So some of these you might just be able to do off the top of your head. Don't even grab a calculator. Others of them you might want to use your calculator to do the subtraction. But you don't care what the sign is. So I don't care whether you do x minus x bar or x bar minus x. It makes no difference. It doesn't matter what the sign is. So whatever value your calculator spits out, you're just going to write down the positive part for me. So on the first one, it's actually 1.9. What did I have? 1.86. Right? All right, so if you took 22 now, and you take 22, and we'll do this one together. So you take 22 minus 18, 19, excuse me, 0.86. We have 2.14. We've got that twice, so we can rewrite it a second time. Then we have 17 minus 19.86. It's negative, but we don't care. We're just going to do 2.86. Okay, it's always the absolute value. Then we have 30 minus 19.86. That one's kind of large. It's 
I have another 18, but I had that before, so I'm just going to rewrite that 1.86. And the last one's a 12, which gives me, again, absolute values 7.86. Okay, so we're just doing subtraction, taking the absolute value, it's all one step. Everybody good so far? Okay, the next thing we're going to do for mean absolute deviation is we're going to add them all together. So you probably do want your calculator for that because there's seven values here with two decimal places each and so forth and that's kind of messy. Add it up to that. Did yours do that as well? Those of you who did a chance, had a chance, okay, good. And then we take the average, which means we take that 28.86 and we divide it by our number of values, which here is 7. And your calculator will spit out for us an answer that we will use. And we're going to go with two decimal places, so this is 4.12. That's measuring how spread out the data is with the mean absolute deviation. Okay, I have a feeling the next page is going to tell us to do the same thing, but do standard deviation. I'm sorry, variance first. Okay, so here's the cool thing. Much of this table can simply be re recopied, okay? So I know that you guys don't have copy pasting, but I do, so I'm going to use it. So over here, I'm going to write this down. And while it doesn't say anything in our directions about having the absolute value, we can use the absolute value. And the reason that we can is if you take a look over here at the directions, on um, step three it says we're going to square things. What happens when you square things to their signs? They all become positive, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter if I had positives, it doesn't matter if I have negatives, I can think of them as absolute values because I'm just going to square them all anyway. So I can do the absolute value just like I did before, right here, and then I will have another column. So go ahead and jot those down again. And in our next column, what we're going to do after you've done that is we're going to square those values. So I'll pause while you get the table written in again. Once you've had a chance to get all those just copied over, you're going to take each one of those values one at a time and square them. So you really want your calculator to do that. Um, go ahead and keep all the decimals for now. We'll round at the very end of everything. You should end up with four decimals on each problem that you're squaring unless they happen to round down to three, but I think they'll all be four. Oh, never mind. I lied. No, I didn't. I just squared it. I did times two instead of squaring it. There we go. 
Um, it would be nicer, in fact, it would be very nice if our mean had been a whole number, right? If the mean had been exactly 20 instead of this 19.86 business, all of our numbers would be very lovely right now. So sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Um, so we're on step four because step three said that we were supposed to square everything. Step four said to add it all up, okay? So we're going to add everything together. So definitely your calculator will be your friend for that. So I have for my sum. Does anybody add them together to check? Work out okay? Yes? No? Am I off on any? We're good? Okay. Um, and then we do the average just like we did before. So we take that value, that 188.9976, divide by our values, which is 7. And the tricky thing on this one is that if you look at this expansion, let me write it down so you can see. That would be four decimals worth. That last one would actually be. Six, five, seven, whatever. Um, if I try to round to two decimals right there, then this nine is going to make the next nine round up. So rounded to two decimals, this actually ends up being 27.00. Okay. All right, so that's variance. And then what did I say we have to do for the standard deviation once we have the variance? Just take the square root. So I need the square root of that 27. And that gives me, again, with two decimals, 5.20. Any questions on that? Now we're going to talk a little bit about what standard deviation does for us next. Um, and it's definitely interrelated, but you'll have to give me a second to get to it. Um, sort of taking a step back, we're going to talk about a specific type of distribution that is very commonly used. And you've heard it used before, but didn't recognize probably that this is what it meant. Um, this is actually called a normal distribution. Um, a normal distribution is a smooth bell-shaped curve that depicts frequency values distributed symmetrically around the mean. So visually speaking, it looks something like this. And you've probably heard it called the bell curve before. You may not have heard phrase normal distribution, but you probably have heard bell curve. Um, when people ask for you to grade on a curve, this is actually what grading on a curve is, not what you thought it was, which was just add a bunch of points to everybody's scores, right? That's what everybody thinks it means. It's not what grading on a curve means. Grading on a curve means balancing out the high values and the low values around the mean. So the mean ends up happening to be in the center, so we'll mark it in here like this. And then we're balancing how far away from the center we go with our data. Um, believe it or not, we actually, when I was a graduate student at the University of Kansas, we did grade our pre-calculus exams on a curve. So we did this. We found the average, the mean, we put it in the middle, and then we balanced out so that there were approximately 
this percentage, I'll tell you what it is in a minute, it's down below, but this percentage within one standard deviation of the mean. And then, so that would be our C range. These were our Bs and our Ds on either side of that. And then out a little further, right, one more standard deviation, we had our Fs and our As. That's how we did it. That's what grading on a curve means. Now, it's not very good um, if you have lots of high scores. Grading on a curve actually is very detrimental. You might end up having an 80-something and getting a C. Right? This is, this is a bell curve issue. Um, what the problem is, is that not everything is normally distributed, right? So in our case, when we were looking at grades up at that particular university, we had hundreds of students taking the same course across the board, right? Different professors and so forth, but hundreds of them taking it. Well, when you have hundreds of people taking something, it's quite different than when you have 20 people taking something. Because I could have 20 very high achieving students, or I could have 20 very low achieving students in a particular classroom, and neither one really makes sense to grade on a curve. But the more people that you add all into the mix as a grand scheme of things, the more it does make sense. So that's why that phrase has come about. So what you see happening is, again, I'll put the dashed lines in right here, that's my mean. But this piece right inside of here, highlighted in yellow, is one standard deviation away, and it's 68% of the data. If you go out a little bit further and you include both the yellow and this blue, so now you get all of this, then you're at 95% of the data. And then if you go out a little further to three standard deviations and you get all of this out here, that gives you 99.8% of, of the data. So practically everybody, right? Not everybody, but practically. 99.8% is quite almost all. So we're going to do an example, not about grades, um, about phone calls is what we're going to do. Um, my husband and I were actually having a conversation the other day. Do people still talk on the phone? Okay, those of you who are married recently and, or are dating, do you talk on the phone to your significant other? Is that a thing still? Oh, that's so good to hear. We were a little concerned. All we see our kids ever do is text, but none of them are in relationships, so maybe that's why. I don't know. Just curiosity question there. All right, so we've got a phone call. Um, we are told that it's normally distributed. If we're not told it's normally distributed, then we can't do this bell curve business. It doesn't make any sense because not everything's normally distributed. As I gave an example, this class is not normally distributed. You guys are a high-achieving group. You're not a normally distributed group. It wouldn't make any sense, okay? So if it says it's normally distributed, that's the key that tells us that we can draw our bell curve. And so every time you're working with one of these normally distributed situations, you're gonna draw a bell curve. And you're gonna put the data in that it gives you. So it says that the average phone call lasts eight minutes. So right here in the center, we're gonna put this dashed line and we're gonna call that eight. It says that the standard deviation is two minutes. So what that means is that we're gonna go out two minutes and then another two minutes, and then another two minutes. So my first two minutes is gonna take me, and you can do dotted lines, you can do solid lines, it doesn't really matter. Take me out to 10 and six. And going out to, uh, to two more, it takes me out to 12 and four. And then we're gonna to go to our three standard deviations out one more time, takes me down to two and up to 14. So that's the basic setup. Don't care what the question asks next. We are always going to draw the basic setup with the mean there and the senior deviations marked on the outsides of it. Okay? I'm not looking for super accurate bell curves. As you can see, mine's just sort of thrown up there. But the idea is that you're going to be able to use it as a visual representation for what the question asks you for next. So let's look, look to the question that it says. In fact, before I do that, I'm going to copy this to the next screen because I'm going to need it in a minute anyway for over here. Let's go back. All right, this one says, what percentage of the phone calls are between six and eight minutes? So that's this part of the graph. So you're going to shade it in, and you're going to use these percentages over here that are given with a little bit of arithmetic, right? Some adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, whatever it takes to find the piece that they're indicating. 
So any idea how we could use those percentages from the empirical rule, the 68, the 95, or the 99.8, to find that shaded region? You're exactly right. So if the phone call had gone all the way over here to 10, that would be 68. But this is a symmetric curve, and I only have half of it. So it is 68% divided by 2. That's 34%. Does that make sense? So you only divided it by two because it took just half of Half of the, yes, it takes this one standard deviation and it only takes half of it. Okay. So it's only one standard deviation in one direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, slightly different question. Same setup. What percentage of the phone calls lasted less than four minutes? So we have to be a little bit careful as we're shading this because it's not just between the two and the four. It's all the way over here, too. Okay? It's going to shade everything to the left of four. This one's harder, and there's more than one way to do it. Any thoughts about how we might want to do this problem? Uh, yep, that one's 95%. And then I would take from the 12 to the 14, right? And that would be the difference between 99.8 and 95 divided by 2, right? It would. I think you're making it a little harder than you need to. The 95% part was really good, though. That's a great place to start. Can anyone think of a way to use that 95% to find what we're looking for? Right. So the piece that's left out is that pink piece and the piece over here that's the mirror image of the pink piece. Right? Those two pieces over there are the pieces that are not actually in the 95%, right? So if I took 100% and I took away that 95%, then those two sort of tail ends would have to be 5%, the two tail ends together combined. But I don't have both of them, I only have one of them. So I only need half of that, so I get 2.5%. You can do it as a decimal or as a fraction, it doesn't matter. So those two edges end up being the other 5%. Way to tag team it, ladies. Good job. Okay. One more question. What percentage of the phone calls lasted more than 12 minutes? So we'll shade over here. It will be the same thing. It's the other tail that I didn't have before. So again, two and a half percent. So you're always basing everything on the fact that there's a hundred percent of the data underneath that curve. And then you have these marks to give you guidelines where the 68, the 95, and the 99.8 fall within that. Let's try another one. This one has a little uh, difference at the end of it that we have to be aware of, but it starts out much the same. The mean IQ for 1,500 students is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So we're starting with that image. It says normally distributed. That's what lets me draw my, my normal curve. It tells me my mean is 100. And I'm going to have to do standard deviations, three in each direction. Okay, and it says the standard deviation is 15. Okay, remember, this is the same standard deviation we calculated before. Like, this, same, this is what we're finding. Right, this stuff over here where it talked about how we calculated standard deviation, 
this process and then taking the square root. This is what it is. This is what it's being used for. Um, do you guys remember when I did the example of the Huntington's disease? Um, and I talked about, um, I don't even know if I told you this, but um, age of onset is determined, the, the average age of onset is based on your parents' average age of onset with a standard deviation of 18 years. It's very spread out data, right? So if my dad's age of onset was 40, his was a little older than that, but if it was 40, then it would be perfectly reasonable to be having an age of onset anywhere from 22 up to 58. Huge standard deviation. Okay, so we have 15 in this case. So we've got 115, 130, and 145 if we add the 15s. If we subtract them, we have 85, 70, and 55. So that's our basic image. I'm going to use the same image on the next couple slides, so I'm going to copy-paste it. Okay, this one says we want to go between 85 and 115. So here's 85 to 115. Now, there's two problems here. The problem actually says how many students. So we need to make sure we answer that at the end. But before we get to that, what's the percentage that this represents based on what we were doing before? Yeah, this is 68%. Okay, now we've worked with percentages. We've worked with them in terms of proportions and we've worked with them in terms of decimals. So you have two different ways you can approach this problem. One option is you can set it up as a proportion. You've got X out of your 1,500 students equals 68 out of your 100% of your students. You can cross multiply, right? So we can do this. So I have 102 oh, oh, oh. and then if I divide by 100 then I get 1020 students that's how we did it with proportions so you're welcome to use that if you want to do it as a decimal you can take the 68 percent as a decimal which is 0.68 and you can multiply that by 1500 it's definitely quicker, a little bit less clear why that works, but it still is okay, and you'll still get your 1020 students. So of the 1500 students, about a thousand of them are in that middle range. Make sense? Okay, let's try another one. This one wants to have an IQ over 145. So it's out here in this little extremity over here. Okay, so we've had one that was kind of like this on the phone calls question. Not exactly, but kind of. How could I find that value? You're really close. We are going to divide something in half, but it's not 2.5. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to take our 100% of our data, like we did on that other one, but instead of subtracting off 95%, we're going to subtract off 99.8%, which is very small, right? And then we will take that and divide that by 2. So that ends up giving me 0.1%. So Destiny is exactly right. We are going to be dividing by 2. And then Faith got the kicker for it. So it's 99.8 this time instead of 95. Okay, so that's the percentage. But that's not exactly what the question asked. The question asks how many students, right? 
So again, you can choose which method you like to use. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. You can choose which method you like to use, but we need to multiply that um, or find that value out of the 1500. So either 0 0.1 times 1500 or set it up as a proportion. I'm gonna go with it this, this time like this. So, oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. We need to turn this into a decimal first and then multiply by our value. So as a decimal, this becomes 0, 0, 001. It's very small, right? Because it's percent. So 0, 0, 0.001 times 1500. What does that give you? What'd you get, Katie? 1.5. You're right. Okay, so say that again really loud. 1.5 students. 1.5 students. not going to work for our final answer. Why not? We cannot have half a person. So we're just going to round with normal rounding rules. 1.5 is going to represent for us two students. No chopping students in half today. Okay. All right, we have one more of this variety before we shift gears to our last topic for the day. This one wants us to have an IQ between 70 and 145. All right. So what do you think? So let me first make an observation. The same amount is not shaded on the left as is shaded on the right. Agreed? So it's not exactly one of the values that we have from our chart. But it should be between them. If we went from 70 to 130, what would it be? 95%. And if we went from 55 to 145, it would have been 99.8%. So whatever my answer is, so if you're just thinking um, in terms of what seems reasonable, it needs to be between those values, right? Because it's more than one and it's less than the other one because we're sort of missing this corner piece that's not shaded between 55 and 70. What if you do like 99.8 minus 95? You could. And then divide that by two. So, okay, let me, let me follow what you're doing. So you wanted to do 99.8% minus 95%. Okay, so if we did that, can you tell me sort of on this diagram what regions that would be finding the area of? Can you tell? It would be the 55 to 70 and then the 130.5. Awesome. So it would be finding this piece and it would be finding this piece added together, right? You could definitely do it this way. I don't think I've ever had anybody suggest this before, so good job. Um, if we do that, we're going to get 4.8%, uh, like you said, then divided by 2. So 4.8 divided by 2 means it's 2.4%. So what that tells me is that this is 2.4%, which is actually useful information because what could I do with it then? You would subtract it from the 99.8 or mm -hmm. add it to the 95. Right. So 99.8%. And we could subtract our 2.4%, or you're right, you could take your 95% and you could add it. Either way you go, you should be getting 97.4%. Would you like to look at one other option? Okay. Um, another way that you can think about it is we have got this nice symmetric graph, and you know how to find the area between the middle and an outer edge like this, because we did that one on our very first problem. We take that area, in this case it would be 95% and divide by two. So we could take that area and find it as 95 divided by two. That would be the part on the left. And then the part of the right to go out, we would take this as 99.8 divided by two. 
and add those together. So when things aren't balanced, there's often more than one way to do the problem, and sometimes more than one correct way. There's always more than one way. It's just not always correct. There's more than one correct way for a lot of these when we're looking at them. Either way you do it, you're going to get the same answer on this one. Any questions on that? Yep, Jenna? Oh, thank you. Yes, I didn't get to that far. Thank you so much. You're correct. All right, so we need to figure out how many students that is. You're exactly right. So I have 97.4%. I'm going to shift this up here. And um, we'll just, for the sake of space, go ahead and do the 0.974 times my 1,500 students. Uh, and that gives me 1,461 students. Okay, any questions? All right, the very last thing we're going to look at today is called percentiles. Percentiles. Oh, my goodness. Does everybody know that we're in state testing right now? My whole household knows it. My daughter, my oldest daughter was last week. My two middle kids are this week. Um, my student teacher had students coming, finishing up, finalizing their uh, you know, review when I went and saw him last week. So everybody's state testing. Um, state testing is done in percentiles. So just about any standardized test that you've looked at tells you your percentile when you're done. You may or may not have realized what that percentile tells you. So a percentile actually shows a person's score relative to other scores, not compared to the test itself or whatever it is. It's compared to other scores. For example, a score in the 90th percentile means that approximately 90% of all other scores are lower than this score. So the reality is 50% on a standardized test means you're average, and that's not a bad thing, right? And it also means that for every score that's high, there has to be scores that are low, because that's how you do comparisons like this. Does anybody know anything besides standardized testing that does percentiles? Your graduation class rankings, either from high school or sometimes even from college. Mm -hmm. Anything non-academic that you know? Growth. growth. Yeah, growth is one of the big ones. So um, you, when you have small children all the way even till now, I go and they look at growth charts. Have a little one who you've probably seen her around before, and she's about this big around, this big, seriously. And so they're always concerned about her weight, especially because she's on ADHD meds because that can affect your appetite. And so they look at how her weight is going on the growth chart, and as long as she's still in the same growth curve, they're cool with that. She's never going to be overweight. This child is super lucky, all right? She's got other things that she's not so lucky with, but that one's a real big blessing. So they look at her weight, or her, uh, yeah, her weight. Um, sometimes they'll look at height, and they also look at your comparison of your height to your weight a lot of time, your percentiles of your height to your weight. Um, another one they did for my son when he was little is that my son had a mild case of hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is water on the brain. Um, it can happen um, as a result of a lot of things. We think probably he might have fallen or was dropped at some point when we, before we had him. And so he had an unusually large um, head circumference size. So they did the same sort of thing. They were looking at growth charts, and they wanted to see that his head circumference was coming down on the growth chart. It was still going to grow for a while, right? That was the expectation, but they wanted to see that the growing was occurring at a slower rate as we went by looking at growth charts. So growth charts is another biggie for percentiles. Okay, so we're going to do an example. This will be our last one for today. Junior was ranked 50th in his graduating class of 325 students. Liz was in the 75th percentile of the same graduating class. These are two different ways of measuring their location in comparison to other people. The question is, which student had the higher GPA when they graduated? Okay, so basically one's counting from the top down and the other one's counting the number of people that are below them. So we need to get them into the same comparison state. So question is, do you want to count from the top down and find out where they rank 
Or do you want to count from the bottom up and find out what percent of people lie below them? Top down. Okay, we're really going to do both. We're going to do top down first since that's what you said. All right, top down. So we've already got one person. Junior is in the 50th, okay? And then it says 75th percentile for Liz. So if we're looking at the placement, we have Junior is 50th. Okay, so if we're looking for Liz and she's got 325 people in her class, we need to figure out where that puts her in her placement. In other words, how many people are below her? So we need to know what 75% of the 325 students is to do that, because that's the number of students approximately who are below her. And I get 243.75. So we'll round to a nearest whole person and say 244. So there are 244 people below Liz. So how can we find out where Liz falls? So we should be able to take our 325 and subtract off the 244. That's 81. So she's the 80, that's not right, the 81st. So if Junior is the 50th ranked and Liz, this is Liz, is the 81st ranked, who has the higher GPA? Junior. Junior. Now let's say that we wanted to do it the other direction where we calculated their percent that's below them. What's their percentile? Well, we know that Liz is in the 75th percentile, which is very good, right? She did better than 75% of all the other students in her class. That's very good. So then we have Junior, and so Junior has 50, that he, or he's 50, so there's 325 minus 50, or 275 people that are below Junior. That's people, though, and I need a percent, right? So that 275 out of the 325, and I need to know what percent that is. So I'm going to set this one up as a proportion for us. We will cross multiply. So I have 325x equals 27,500. And he is in the 84.6. So again, we'll use whole numbers. It makes more sense to talk about um, the 85th percentile. So again, that means 85% of people scored below junior. Only 75% scored below Liz. So again, my answer from this other perspective, which it should be the same, and it is, it's junior. Any questions about that? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We are officially finished with this section, but you haven't done group work. And we don't have a real reason to super rush because we're going to have some extra time next time. So we'll do the group work in class next time. If you'd like to get started on the homework for this, more power to you, that's fabulous, but it won't be due till Friday. Okay, so we'll make this due on Friday. Group work in class next time. You're getting new groups. And we're also doing the hands-on equations in class next time, at least the first three sections. That's what we will plan on, okay? See you guys next class period.